Hello, thank you for checking out my video today. Today's video, I'm gonna talk about the next phase of my motherboard project. Just got these in from JLCPCB. Um, where I'm going with this is, I wanted to make a simpler version of my motherboard that um, required less parts, could be built quicker. Um, as many of you that follow me may know, you know, I've just gotten pretty busy with work. So to solder up a board, I, I just don't have time, but something this size, I, I have time to do something like that. So this board here, it's a four layer board. It's got everything on it that my motherboard has, and it plugs into a back plane. So this board replaces, now all these are depopulated because I moved them over to the finished board. The, so the memory card gets replaced, the processor card, the DMA card, if you have one, some of them were built into the motherboard, and then the motherboard. So where this board saves a lot of time is you're not soldering all your um, ISA slots. You can get a backplane, um, something like this. Um, I've seen them for as low as about 35 bucks. So it saves you a lot of time in soldering all this together. Um, this back plane actually happens to be kind of the old power style. I've seen the newer ones, obviously. So let's move some of this stuff out of the way. What we have, the finished board here. So what I did was I eliminated anything that wouldn't be necessary to run. We've got, everything's really squished together. We've been four layers. I was able to get the traces tighter and get them around the chips easier. But you still have, starting up here in the left corner, still have two uh, 8, 2, 8, 4 um, clock chips. You got your 24 megahertz and your... 14.31818 megahertz um, crystal. So this one's for the processor, this one's for the DMA and ISA bus. Then I've got my processor, obviously. Uh, I got a V20 in this one today. I've got my memory decoder. Um, got my upper address latch, my lower address latch, and my data transceiver. And then just in a row here, nice and tight, I've got my 512k, my my 128k uh, RAM, and then I have my 512, or sorry, it's a 64k ROM. So it's a um, then my interrupt controller, my uh, interval timer, and then down here I've got the this is part of the DMA. You got your uh, address latch for the A8 through A15. And then I've got these two chips, which make up my port 61 so that you can turn your speaker on and off and your channel check on and off. That's the only thing my port 61 does. And then part of the keyboard logic, uh, LS07 here. Across the top, I've got a uh, clock divider. So this divides down for the keyboard controller and uh, for, there's something else it divides down for. But anyway, the keyboard controller, and then we've got, I've got another ROM right here. So this ROM replaces about, I don't know, six decoding, you know, LS-138s, uh, 139s. And it's a 64K ROM, and it's the chip select. So the data zero through seven are the chip select for your internet controller, your, system, your interval timer, Keyboard, port 61, your um, DMA controller, and your index register for the DMA controller. Um, works out pretty good. And the nice part about this is it's reprogrammable. And it's very specific. So every address line is decoded. Um, so you don't have like errant, um, like the keyboard controller showing up 
multiple times in your IO bus because some lines aren't decoded. Um, so next to this, I've got uh, LOS 139, 138, and this is the RAM and ROM decoding for here. And then I've got a 126, 125, and these are used in conjunction with the IO selecting um, for in, in, with the IO decoding. So got the keyboard controller. I, I've really wanted to get away from a 44 pin and go to a dip 44 or sorry, 40. And, but these ones are just so much more cost effective, even though you got to pay a little extra for the socket. Um, the 40 pin keyboard controllers I'm seeing are about four bucks a piece, which would make it the most expensive chip on the board. Um, DMA controller here. Um, DMA controller, I've always had kind of hard feelings towards it. I I don't really use it. The only thing you really need it for is a floppy drive. Um, the only thing I use a floppy drive for is to make sure it works. And that's, but it's important to have this to have a complete system. So I, I really debated about leaving this off, but I kept it on there so that the system would be complete and fully XT compatible. And then index register, as we talked before, and then your keyboard socket. So what I also did on here was I included a header, and I don't think I'm going to solder this on all boards because I want to be able to plug this board into a breadboard socket and just boot it as a standalone headless 8088. So I've got the header on here, and um, obviously I need to solder these on at a 90 degree angle. I've got some in my toolbox so you can just plug in directly and you cut the hole in the the bracket uh, I had one on my desk here but don't have it widely available so right now what I would do is just drill the hole in the bracket for the keyboard and then just leave this unsoldered in because that way you can use a standalone USB hard drive or whatever other mass storage device you want to use. But then like this is still an option if that's how you want to go. The nice part about this, so I've just put this labeled as CS7, so chip select seven coming off of uh, your IO decoding. You can actually reprogram to, that to any IO address you want. Um, and then A2 is included on the header. So you'd have, you know, a couple of address lines there for that. So you could use this for something else other than the USB. So it's a complete board. You throw in the USB and it is 100% ready to boot with a hard drive. This will boot DOS right there. Right now the BIOS I have, now obviously you gotta include on your BIOS the drivers or, or the, for the USB here. I guess they're not really drivers, but the BIOS extension you gotta include on your BIOS. With with this one, you don't want your BIOS extension, and then you've got, you just plug this in and the BIOS extension's on that extra ROM chip there. So as I mentioned, it, it plugs into a backplane. So that's where the size and cost effectiveness comes in for this setup. So I'm gonna piece it together here. We'll do a little boot demo. Okay, that should be all we need to boot the system. Now I put it on my, my bigger monitor here. Power supply is pretty loud. Um, with this bigger monitor, it's a little off the screen, but I think it's better because then we can see it better here in the video. So that's, it's booting pretty quick. Let's run check it. Um, 
check the system board real quick. Now the DMA controller channel zero will always fail on my boards because I don't include the DMA refresh. I didn't even include a jumper on this board. I may put it in in later versions so that if you really want uh, a fake DMA refresh cycle. Um, so as you can see, channel zero failed on the DMA refresh. Let's check our benchmarks here. Okay, so you can see this is an 8 megahertz V20. You can see it's twice the speed of an IBM PC XT, and it's noticeable. Um, the mass speed's quite a bit more. There is no uh, coprocessor on this one. It's not even set up for it. I don't have the hardware to add it. It would actually require a little bit more hardware. I've never really gone down that road. You know, in the times I ever owned a 8088, I uh, never had one that had a coprocessor. So it's not been a big concern of mine to add it to the project. Um, let me show booting this with a floppy drive while we're doing this initial video. So I've got my floppy drive emulator. This works as good as, uh, I've already tested it. It works with the emulator and with a regular floppy drive. The emulator is just a little bit, uh, my disks are getting a little corrupt. So that's why I'm using the emulator today. Just plug it in the power. So the boot will be a little slower with this as it reads from the drive. It still will mount the uh, USB. Uh, plug in a mouse as well. Might have to reboot it, but we'll give it a try. So this is booting from the floppy drive. Um, took me a minute to get this working. I had to troubleshoot the board. We'll go over that here in a minute. Um, see colon. See if the mouse will uh, install. Pass for A colon, that's why I went to DOS. All right, so there's the mouse working. So the system's pretty functional. I mean, being a homemade system, it does have some odd glitch here or there, but generally it doesn't cause any problems while running it. Um, but it's fully functional. You got your floppy drive, your mouse, keyboard, um, pretty confident. I haven't tried it yet, but pretty confident the network will work because, so this is built, like I said, identical to my existing projects. So let's shut it down and I want to go over where I'm at on the board. So being that this is my initial board, I was actually really surprised. It booted right up the first time I, the first time I pushed the power button. It was uh, kind of nice, you know, but there were still a few glitches. So on here, initially, there's an address enable coming off the DMA, and I tied the uh, resistor to pull um, up instead of pull down, I think. So I it was tied to this network resistor network array here. And so I had to unsolder it. I clipped the pin off. And then on the back, I put in the correct, um, I want to say it'd be a, a pull-down resistor on it. 
there was a little power line. This wasn't power for the DMA controller. There's a five volt pin that wasn't connected. So I connected that. And then on the keyboard, I connected the housing to ground and I changed that on the PCB design as well. And I've got these new PCBs on order already. They should be here in about a week and then I won't have to make these little modifications. There's another one here. Um, so when the DMA controller takes over, um, it holds the processor and all the, the lines just kind of float. And with that, the data transceiver, the enable pin kind of floats. Well, I learned this years ago. I would get static, like, because I was trying to get, I think, some screen images. And I get static on my screen. And it's because there was a little bit of bleed through because this was enabling and disabling. So you got to put a resistor to pull the enable high. And I had it tied low. So that was preventing the floppy drive from working when the DMA controller took over. Um, I had a 8237, just a regular one, originally for the DMA controller. It just got really hot. And I, I want to say they're only good for 3 megahertz. So I added in this dash five, so it's good for five megahertz. Um, then the address latch for the DMA controller for A8 through 15 had a bent pin that took me about an hour to find. Every time I would squeeze the board on the, on, when it was on the back plane, the screen would go blank. It didn't crash the system, but there was a weird, you would touch in here and it just blank out. It's not doing that anymore since I fixed it. it was the ground pin actually. So the big thing here, as you can see, there's a lot fewer just regular resistors across the board. There are more of these network resistor arrays. They're quicker to um, solder in. You don't have to clip as many wires. Um, on the reset, I just added in a capacitor so you don't have this tied into the power good line off the power supply anymore. But anyway, generally speaking, I'm very happy with this. This is probably the way I'm going to go with the project for now. I don't think I'm going to make the bigger boards anymore at all. We'll just go with these. So it should be able to reduce the overall purchase price of the motherboard. Um, except for, of course, you're going to have to buy a back plane and a video card to go along with it. I'll need to kind of know, I guess, in the comments if you'd rather see this as a, a standard install and this included with the board or if this is irrelevant and just leave that kind of as an optional deal. So anyway, uh, thanks for checking out the video today.